how are we going to do this? How do you prevent blood clots? The first thing is to get smart, and that's what you're all here doing, hopefully. Um, we have mechanical prophylaxis and pharmacologic prophylaxis. So let's talk about those individually. So how do you get smart? Well, the first thing is to know what the heck we're talking about. Know the risk factors for DVT and PE. Know your family history. You've got to talk to your family. I know it's painful, but you've got to talk to these people. Um, you can write letters. You can send emails. You don't have to do it directly. You can be anonymous, whatever, but you've got to get the information. Okay, talk to your family. Make sure they know what's going on with you medically. Make sure you know what's going on with them medically. Um, ask grandma, because you know, there's always somebody that knows. There's always some older relative that knows everything about everybody. So you've got you to find that person and, 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 and get the scoop before, they get, before it's too late. Um, know the symptoms of DVT and PE. I mean, that's part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate the public. And the hope is that if we educate the public and they come in and ask their doctors about this, this will be a wake-up call to the physician and say, hey, I've got to know this. These people are interested in this. This is on the radar. I got to bone up on this stuff. So when you guys get smart, we get smart because you force us to think about what's on your mind. You force us to know what we're talking about so we can answer your questions effectively. And then talk to your healthcare provider about this. There are statistics that show that very few people have this conversation with their doctor. And it's, you know, it, there's no reason for this. We have conversations about weight management, about blood pressure, about risk factors for heart attack. We have don't smoke anymore talks. We have all these conversations. There's no reason that venous thrombosis shouldn't be on that list. All right, how do we prevent clots from a mechanical prophylaxis standpoint? Well, the first thing is to stay active. So get up and walk around, which is sort of not what you're doing right now. Um, I'm, I'm done almost very soon. So, so do this, not this. Don't be Homer Simpson laying on the couch um, with a beer can on your fat belly. Get out and walk. Stay active. Move around. Okay? Maintain a healthy weight. Be active. Be mobile. We do the same thing after surgery. We get people up and we walk them around. It's not because we're mean. We want to kick them out of the hospital. I mean, that's part of it. But we, we really want people up walking around because that helps prevent clots. It's, it's safe, it's cheap, and it's good for you. So we should be doing more of this. Um, we have compression stockings that, that are very effective at helping to prevent blood from, from pooling in the legs. So stasis. You can wear these things when you travel. You can wear these things when you're laying around. You can wear them to work under your clothes. Nobody knows. It's awesome. Um, we put these on people in the hospital. Pneumatic compression devices are sort of just fancier ways of compressing things. So these are, are pneumo boots, we call them. You wrap these things around your legs. They're hooked up to a little gizmo that pumps air in and out and mechanically squeezes back and forth and encourages blood to flow. So these are all the things that we should be doing to prevent blood clots. And we haven't really spent much money. We haven't given you any medicine yet. All we're doing is mechanical, very simple, straightforward things. And we don't do enough of this. What about pharmacologic prophylaxis? Now, this is where we start to use medications, okay? We think someone's risk of clotting is high enough because they're in the hospital, they've had surgery, they've got the wrong family history, they've got enough other risk factors. We've got to do more than just mechanical prophylaxis. And so the use of blood thinners um, is something that's, that's we, we don't do enough of this. I mean, it's very, very clear that this is effective prevention. There's evidence-based guidelines that are published that say we should do this, and, and honestly, we're lousy at it. We don't do enough of this. We, we don't identify people at risk appropriately enough and, and use this like we should. We're, we're trying very hard to change that. All hospitals now uh, are, are under the gun because of things the Surgeon General is saying and, the, and the, the way the reimbursement is going to happen. If we don't do this and people get clots, we're going to get dinged for it. So it's very important that we do this and do it appropriately. And, and why don't we do it? Well, I think part of it is, again, under awareness. We don't realize how big of a problem this is. Again, think about preventable hospital death. You know, if all that takes is a little shot of heparin once a day while you're laying around the hospital to prevent a fatal pulmonary embolism, it's money well spent. So there's under-awareness. I think there's also an over-concern about the risk of bleeding. You know, we put people on blood thinners right after surgery. It's kind of counterintuitive. Like, well, I just had surgery. I shouldn't be putting on a blood thinner. What if I'm going to bleed? You know, we know what we're doing with these drugs. These drugs, if they're used appropriately, are very safe. The risk of bleeding is extremely low, and the risk of clotting is much higher than that. So if you think about it from that perspective, there's really no reason not to do this. The um, important thing is to discuss this prior to surgery. Um, this is something you should be talking to your doctor about. Everybody goes to the doctor before surgery to get your pre-op clearance. On the list of things ought to be a discussion about what kind of venous thrombosis prophylaxis should you have. If the doctor doesn't bring it up, you should. It's also important to recognize that you don't have to be a surgical patient to need venous thrombosis prophylaxis. I think for many, many years, we've only thought about this in people having surgery Many of our medical patients are at risk for venous thrombosis and ought to have prophylaxis as well. And then sometimes during and after pregnancy, and we're going to hear more about that this afternoon from Colleen Morton. Okay, so there's lots of things we can do to prevent this. What happens if our preventative measures fail? 
how do we diagnose a clot? And I want to just whip through some of the clinical signs and symptoms, talk about one of the lab tests that we use a fair amount, and then show you some cool pictures. Um, so deep vein thrombosis, clinical findings, pain, swelling, tenderness, discoloration, warmth, and asymmetry, one leg looking different than the other. These are all classic signs of venous thrombosis. Sometimes they're fairly subtle. Um, here's a picture of a guy with a calf vein clot, and it's maybe difficult to see in the back here, but his left leg is just a little bit more swollen than the right leg. He's had it wrapped up with an ace bandage. You can kind of see the lines there uh, from where the bandage has been compressing things. So it can be fairly subtle or it can be pretty dramatic. Here's a girl with a big clot in her iliofemoral vein after pregnancy. So sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's more subtle. These, these clinical uh, signs and symptoms of a clot are not specific for a clot. This could be a pulled muscle. This could be um, a skin infection. This could be all kinds of things. But you've got to be thinking about this. Um, pulmonary em embolism is a little less subtle oftentimes. This is just a gory picture of a huge saddle embolism that killed somebody. This is a lung, and this is when they opened up the pulmonary artery, they found all this clot in there. So how do these things show up? Well, sometimes it's sudden death, and that's what happened to this poor person. But oftentimes it's less than that. So shortness of breath, that's what dyspnea means. Chest pain, anxiety, feeling like you can't get enough breath. You're probably having some of that now. Um, cough. <laughs> Hemoptysis is coughing up blood. Again, this is, this is not specific for pulmonary embolism. You could have a bronchitis and cough up some blood and feel shorter breath. You could have pneumonia and cough up some blood and have some pain in your chest and maybe feel shorter breath. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have this, you have a clot. But if you have this, you should be thinking about a clot as well as the other things. And this is the problem when you go to the doctor and they look at you and say, oh, this guy's got pneumonia. And they, they have a diagnosis before they even looked at you. We need to keep this on the top of our list. All right, so blood tests we do. Um, there's a thing called the D-dimer, which is very, um, a very useful test. D-dimer is something that's a breakdown product of a clot. So when your body has laid down a clot and you start to dissolve that clot, that fourth step, the fibrinolysis, um, you release little bits of that clot. And we can measure them in the blood with a very sensitive test called the D-dimer assay. Um, if we check somebody for their D-dimer level and it's normal, we can be really, really sure they haven't had a recent clotting event. So if you come in and you've got a swollen leg or a cough and tortness of breath, and we're trying to figure out is it a, a pulled muscle or, or pneumonia, is it a clot, this is a very helpful test if it's negative. Okay, so a negative D-dimer, we can be really sure you haven't had a recent clotting event. The problem is when it's positive, it could be a clot or a bunch of other stuff. So a positive test just tells us we have to look further. And how do we do that? Well, we have ultrasound, and this is, looks like a picture from a soap opera. It really isn't. Um, so an ultrasound is a non-invasive way of looking at the vein to see if there's a clot in it. And so the cartoon here, there's a, a transducer. We put it over the vein, and then we push down on it. And if there's no clot in there, when we push down with the ultrasound probe, the vein disappears. It's completely collapsible. So you can see the thing. You push down. It disappears from the screen. You know that vein, vein is patent or open. There's no clot sitting in there. On the other hand, if you put the transducer over the vein and you push down, you can't make it disappear. You can't compress it. There's something in there keeping that from happening, and that's a clot. So it's a very simple, easy way of looking for clots. It's a pretty good test. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. 